Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny Podcast. I am your host, Corey Darrigan. Alongside me, as always, is the Spartan Crushing, the Kilimanjaro, the Kiltacular, Josh Finney. Kiltacular. Hi, Josh. Yeah. Man. Hi, Corey. In case you can't tell, we're really excited about Halo this week at Tower Casuals. I know. Dude, I, oh, dude, the Halo anniversary event. Uh, by, by the way, Xbox 20th anniversary this week. Big deal. Dropped Halo Infinite's uh, multiplayer beta. I mean, it's essentially out, right? So, uh, yeah, they're calling it a beta basically for legal reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, nobody crucifies them if it's not working. But achievements, everything is fully there. Um, it, it's... That that is the probably the biggest shadow drop of all time. Yeah, I, I've now become convinced that there. I think there was a little bit of a like legit. We're gonna like trickle this out there just to build the hype for Monday. Yeah. Um. But I I will forever wonder what this looks like if this doesn't leak, uh, Thursday night and Friday morning. Yeah. Uh, you know I I'm up there at the hospital with my mom on uh on Friday morning and like. I had a message when we got done with Tower Casuals last Thursday saying, hey, did you see the rumor that Halo Infinite may release on Monday? And I was like, okay, you know what, whatever. Like, I kind of looked at the source of this rumor. I'm like, eh, okay. Like, they they kind of make things up. Like, I'm not, I'm not really going to worry about it. I'm not going to throw any outlet under the bus. Just like, eh, they, they kind of they kind of take, like, little rumors and run with them. Okay? It's probably some bullshit rumor that's in like, gaming leaks and rumors on Reddit, right? Uh, by Friday afternoon, it was becoming much more real. Um... And then Pringles got into the fray, <laughs> had a countdown clock ending on Monday morning. Of course, I was like, Pringles. Oh, shit. <laughs> Fucking Pringles, man. MVP of the year. Like, it's like Walmart Canada and then Pringles for yeah, like reliable leakers. <laughs> They're on my power rankings now. It, <laughs> I, I guess it would really go like Jeff Grubb, Jess Corden, Walmart Canada, Pringles. Like, they're, they're, in, they're in the power five. They're in the power five right the now. Power five. Uh, Unlike big, your Seahawks. Oh, God, fuck the Seahawks. I don't want to talk about the Seahawks right now. I, I'm fully focused on the Mavs season, which also is not starting off that great. Um, Luca's already hurt. I am not uh, looking forward to the Jason Kidd era. Uh, but this is, I do not think this is a stretch to say this is the biggest shadow drop of all time. Yeah, it's pretty big. Pretty big. To just come out and drop it. Um, I got genuinely emotional when uh, Joe Staten and the uh, God, I'm forgetting his name, the uh, the head of multi the multiplayer suite, um, did the did the intro uh, at the very end of the 20th anniversary event. Which already, like, I was watching this with Colonel Panic. I was getting really emotional watching it. Uh, yeah. So many games that I have a personal connection to, obviously, mm -hmm. are on Xbox. Mm -hmm. And we just kept seeing footage of, you know, Halo, the launch for Halo 2, Halo 3, uh, you know, Gears of War was there. We saw Fable. We saw Morrowind. Um, Kot you know, KOTOR what was named uh, Jade Empire was showed it there. And it's like there, there's so many games. And then a lot of the games I love are coming as the final batch of backwards compatible games, you know, with Max Payne. And Oddworld Munch's Odyssey being two of the ones I'm really looking forward to playing again. And then they just the creme de la creme was this and the the little the little tiny teaser for the Halo TV series on on uh, Paramount Plus. Yeah, which I am just they got the suit right. I'll give them that at this point. <laughs> they got the suit right. Jen Taylor is back as Cortana, which she was not originally. Yeah, I know. Uh, Thank it was God. Going to be the same actress that it and. Natasha McElroy, great actress. I, I like her a lot. She's playing Dr. Halsey. But, man, getting Jen Taylor to do Cortana was so key. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did they confirm still, who's playing Chief yet? Chief is being played by uh, Pablo Schreiber. Right, um, in the suit. But is he playing the voice, the, too? I don't know. Uh, I think him playing Chief does indicate that he's probably going to do the voice. But I also think it may hint that we have a lot of unmasked Chief. Yeah. Have a situation kind of similar to Mando. Yeah. Um, except and that that's where I that's where, you know, Colonel and I were talking about this. It we're so excited for this. We're gonna watch the shit out of this. But man, the fact that they haven't confirmed that Steve Downs is going to be in it really concerns me. Yeah. Um 
Because I, I don't even, and I'm not one of those like purists who's like, oh my god, Steve Downs has to be the voice of Master Chief. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not one of those, but the voice man, is so iconic, though, dude. Like, it really is. I mean, but at the same time, Steve Downs is in his 70s. Um, I don't know that they're going to keep using him past halo infinite and that's not me saying like oh my god steve downs needs to retire that's me saying i think that they may be ready to like set chief aside for a while after the halo campaign yeah comes out yeah um i would really 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 like for him to at least have some sort of vocal cameo in the series like maybe voice another spartan or something like that but this was always in my opinion this was always going to happen like if mm -hmm. you're casting a younger actor and not just putting somebody in a suit that implies to me that you're going to unmask chief in this show yeah and maybe even an in which by, by extension leads me to believe you're going to unmask him in halo infinite because you're going to want that reveal in a game and not a tv series yeah you're definitely going to want it in halo infinite first before the series right and that that leads me to believe that maybe possibly they're going to use uh what's his name pablo schreiber or whatever uh -huh. as the character model for chief's face in the game you think so i, I don't i i think that the halo tv series takes place because i mean he's with cortana i think it takes place sometime before the fall of reach mm. um either before the fall of reach or well yeah it ha i mean it kind of has to did they, right if halls is in it did they confirm that this is part of the oh, game's no, the canon Keith Captain Keys is in this. I know, so... but did they confirm that this is part of the same canon as the I, games? I believe it is in the same canon. I because... do not think it's an adaptation. I think this is an original story with Chief. Because I I know they made a, it was a big deal that they cast Keys and he's a black guy in the in the show. I mean, maybe it's a reimagining of the first game. Yeah. Um, we saw so there were leaked images last summer. Um. And the VFX work on the Prophets looked amazing. So I don't know if this is a retelling of Halo 1 and like maybe Halsey is just there in flashbacks or what. Uh, it seems like a lot of it is going to focus on Chief's training. Um, because if you when you watch the teaser, you see all the cuts and the scars on his back where they put the cybernetic implants into. Yeah. Um, and you see him, you know, like putting on the armor, putting on the helmet and the. Uh, then you hear Jen Taylor's voice, you know, saying yeah. basically like, welcome back, Chief. Yeah. I, I'm i so excited for this. I'm so skeptical, but we've had some really good shows lately for video game properties. And for me, this is kind of the do or die moment for live action game shows. Like, are they actually going to be worth watching or not? Like, because they have supposedly dumped almost $200 million into this series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that does include they had to extensively reshoot a lot of stuff. They had five episodes film completed filming before COVID nineteen, and then the series because the series was going to come out this year, right? And they del it probably honestly would have come out had Infinite come out last fall. It probably would have come out with that. Yeah, it was delayed. They reshot most of those episodes, right. including making the changes to having Jen Taylor in it. The other theory I've heard is that um, maybe Steve Downs isn't the voice of Chief right now because it, he is like, because of his age, he is considered high risk. Yeah. And they don't want to take the chance of getting him into it. No, granted, I'm guarantee you Steve Downs has recording equipment in his house and could do yeah. it. Well, isn't he like, isn't his have... daytime job a re radio host? Yes. So. I, I, would, I would say that a lot of this is they want to... They probably want to be able to coach, uh, coach him and stuff in person because that's that's his that this is his only voiceover role is Master Chief, right? Um, so I I don't know I'm 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 curious I'm curious to see what happens here, yeah. Um, with Steve Downs, but the multiplayer suite dropping a, a incredible moment. I can't tell you the amount of times just in the first three or four days that I've, I've said just one more game and it's turned into like two more hours of playing. Yeah. I don't think I've gone to bed before 2 AM at all since this launched. Um, I was fervently trying to get the, uh, I got the halo series X. I was trying to get it set up, 
while Colonel Panic and I are trying to watch the beginning of this uh, <laughs> Microsoft event. I'm streaming it on my laptop. I'm in a party with him while I'm trying to get the apps to download on my console. And uh, about three minutes in, I was finally able to make the switch over. But God, just it feels so good. Like uh, we've we've talked about the flights before, but this this feels like it's on another level. It's probably the most polished multiplayer I've played at launch in years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strong contender for like ever in the modern era. Yeah. Like when your number one complaint is the battle pass and post match XP. Yeah. I think that's a pretty great one. Yeah. Because you can change that. I mean, they already announced changes were coming by the end of the week. Right. So they might already be they, done by the time they already knew that there were complaints about that coming out of the flighting. Mm -hmm. We got to play with the match XP and with dailies and things like that. And like, I do think there's going to be further refinements before the quote official launch period. Right. Uh, when it comes out on the eighth, I would not be surprised to see them announce a full revamp by then. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, like I said, I've played, I've played a ton this week. I've probably gotten like 60, 70 matches in this week easily yeah. already. And I'm level nine on my battle pass. Yeah. It's, Dude, it's so good. Like, just the movement and the way the guns feel. I had a pretty awesome overkill moment where uh, the one map that's outside from the test flight I was playing, and uh, all their whole team was gathered in the hallway, and I threw a grenade, and then I sh I took some of their health down with the the auto rifle, and then the, the, hand, the brute hand uh, sh shotgun thing. I don't know what it's called yet. I'm really yeah. in the names. I was going down to the hallway, and I took – I took two of them out with that, and then I, I uh, meleeed the last guy in the face, and I got an overkill, and it was like, oh, it was so good, dude. The multi, like the multi kill stuff in Halo, always feels good, but this feels like especially like, ah, oh, man, I wanted to jump up and down and scream. It was awesome. It's amazing. I just like the new way the new weapons feel so good. Like so you have the skewer which the skewer has led to more hero moments than any other weapon for me so far. It's a strong contender for best weapon in the game period. Which one's the skewer? Is that the one with the knife on the, the end of spikes. it? The spikes. Yeah, it shoots the spikes out. Okay. Um I cannot tell you the amount of time I basically have memorized where that and the sniper spawn because one of those will spawn. They will never both spawn, but they will, they will alternate spawns usually yeah. um, on the big team maps. And I, I figure out where the skewer is, get it. And I pretty much just like, I run around the map still playing, but I wait for vehicles. And when I see vehicles, I drop whatever I'm doing and shoot because it's a one hit kill on ghosts, banshees, wasps, mongooses. It is not always a one hit kill on tanks or warthogs, but it will, it will take out like 90% of the Warthog's health. If it's taken any sort of damage, you'll kill it with one hit. Yeah. Um, it feels so good, though, but also like no scoping somebody is so rewarding. Yeah. Uh, with it, you only get four shots, but it's it's basically an anti-aircraft gun. Yeah. Um, it feels really good to use. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been skewered while I'm in a vehicle with it. Um, if you aim for the tires, like that basically does it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know and sometimes you don't have like I tried shooting a ghost the other night and the player who was controlling it jerked out of the way because they were fighting someone else. They didn't even see me, but they jerked out of the way. So instead of it hitting the ghost, it hit them and <laughs> uh, no scoped them straight off of the ghost. Wow. Um, the the grapple shot, though, like the way that that has changed and the way the, the verticality works in the big team maps is something we haven't really seen in big team maps in Halo in a long time, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, no position feels truly safe in this game. In any of the maps, no position is like 100% bonafide, I'm safe here. Yeah. Area. Yeah, I, um, there's always a second way, a second or a third way into a into an area, right? Like you, if you're in a you're in a bunker right. and there's a door on either side, and then you have the big kind of like a big window looking out onto a uh, onto a battlefield or whatever, like you're never safe. Never safe. Um, I like the uh, I like the electric weapons a lot, the disruptor and the shock rifle. I'm a really big fan of those. Um, they've added a they've added a new type of kill, perfect. Basically, if you get the, if you get a headshot, precision headshot with certain weapons, boom, that's it. Like you have to land all headshots. Like you can get, 
Obviously, you can get it with battle rifle, you can get it with the pistol, but if you get it with the shock rifle, you land that one headshot, boom, that's it. They're done. Even if they have full shield, they're done. If you're able to, with that little reticule, if you're able to hit that headshot, they're done. Mm -hmm. It's so rewarding, but also that and the disruptor, the little shock pistol, work as EMPs against the vehicles. Which is also really rewarding, because sometimes that's the difference between somebody scoring and not scoring in Capture the Flag. Mm Mm-hmm. It, everything, every weapon feels good. And this isn't even the full suite of weapons. Like, I'm sure there are more weapons that they will put in there after they make their appearance in the campaign. But right now, having as many as you have that are both banished and UNSC weapons feels so good. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to being able to customize the look of my banished weapons in my, uh, in my armor hall. Yeah. Instead of only being able to do UNSC. That is, that, that's a little minor criticism for me, but... I'm mainly attributing that to they're probably going to let me do that after I played the campaign. Right. Or at least started it. And I want, like, I want to put skins on my banshees and things like that too. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no one type of vehicle feels particularly dominant except for the wasp. Yeah. Um, which again, even the wasp though, high risk, high reward. Yeah. Uh, if you are you you have to stay up in the air to avoid the grapple shots, but you kind of have to get low to get those uh, those kills yeah. on you know regular players. Also, hey, if someone's so running easy. around with a spanker, you're done. <laughs> if they a get spanker, a spanker, sh- um, the sniper, the skewer, like power, dude, even assault rifles will just grind it up. Yeah, uh, it doesn't feel as dominant as it was in Halo Five. Yeah that's probably the most notable thing to me is it doesn't feel like it's an automatic win if you get it now uh but it is so much fun to use i again i i have been i have become the guy who i try to go for that i want that the grapple shot and a skewer or a skewer or a sniper and i'm pretty happy for the rest of the match um it's it's the original game of hero moments though right as far as an fps goes yeah and there have been so many i've hit record so many times on my controller i probably have somewhere between 50 and 60 recordings that i've clipped and i've gone and edited a lot it's like i want to just make like a montage of all the ridiculous things i've done like there there was a wasp that didn't see me it was shooting my teammates and i was crouched uh i was crouched up on a ridge and as soon as it start, i saw it come over and as it started going away i think the pilot saw me at the last second because I ran and jumped off the ledge and shot my grapple thinking I was going to miss and it attached as this dude's flying away. So I'm like zip lining <laughs> practically across the map. It's an auto hijack when you do that. And I kick them out over this big pit that you die if you fall into. Right. That's awesome. And it was just so, so sad. As I have. Granted, I died almost immediately after because their whole team must have, or at least his squad must have seen me mm-hmm. and was like, nope, here's a skewer, here's hey, here's a sniper shot, you're you're going to die. Yeah, but I that moment, a, that moment of attaching the grapple to it and kicking him out, that's a hero moment. In that itself. moment, yeah, the, the death was not captured on camera, so I plead <laughs> the fifth. Uh, man, it's, it's just so good. Like, I... Other than the Trials revamp, the first couple weekends of the Trials revamp, there has not been a multiplayer maybe since Titanfall. Titanfall 1, I should be clear, launched where I've been like, just one more game, just one more game, just one more game. Yeah. And it's been, and I, I say that knowing Titanfall 2 is better, but I have a lot of memories of Titanfall 1. Uh, and it's definitely the most engaged I've been with a Halo multiplayer since I would say the trilogy. Yeah. I never got into... Halo Reach multiplayer, uh, Halo 4 was just such a different experience. I played it mainly as a social thing. I had just yeah. started dating my girlfriend at the time. We played a lot of Halo because it was an easy way for us to talk and have some privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I mean, Halo 5, we all know my opinions about Halo 5. I think we know everyone's <laughs> so, opinions on Halo 5. <laughs> right. Like, I wasn't even a big fan. I wasn't a big fan of the arena. I've grown to not like 4v4 as much the older I've gotten. Yeah. Um. I, w- I think I would like Halo's smaller modes if it was 6 on 6 and not 4v4. Yeah. Um, but that's just, that's my personal take on it. I get that that's a, that's a long time Halo staple. And I look forward to them adding a, sl- a big team Slayer playlist. Cause I think that those, those are the two big feedbacks I've seen big team Slayer just as a permanent mode. Don't mm-hmm. make me sit through the, the rotating carousel. 
Yeah. Uh, because people don't want to play objectives. They yeah. they simply don't. Yeah. And it's really annoying. Like I want it to be the people who want to play objectives are there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like capture the flag so you, for people that don't want to play objectives is super annoying. Just capture the flag for me is less annoying than uh, fucking power cells because people won't even go pick them up. Like you can be one person trying to move like six of these things. Yeah. I was playing oddball the other night and someone went to pick up. Like, oh no, God. I was the only one picking up the ball. Like, yeah. everybody else was just shooting each other. I'm like, do you not understand what Oddball is? Like, <laughs> It's not great. Uh, so, Big Team Slayer needs to be a playlist, and I've already seen a lot of calls for SWAT to be a permanent game mode. Yeah. And you have to think that that's probably going to come with, like, the title update for campaign. Right. Is that those two, that they had to have known Big Team Slayer was going to be the biggest request. Yeah. So, I, I feel like both of those will be a thing. Um and they'll probably they might do another ranked playlist of like ranked for before slayer yeah but that that's about it i mean it feels really good i look forward to them making more maps like i like the maps that we have but i definitely want of course this dog is going nuts in the hallway these people are moving out finally so this should be the last time we ever hear this dog on this show <laughs> um, movers have been moving them out all day and it's been so rewarding for me <laughs> but I, I think that that's probably the biggest thing you have to focus on right now is they're, they're going to have to put map, they're going to have to get more maps out there. Like if I know three, four, three, they probably have a bunch sitting in reserve. Like we were, we were laughing the other day. We're like, how on earth did you launch a new halo and not have blood gulch in it? Like if this is really the spiritual reboot of halo, like blood gulch needs to be in this game. You think we'll get classic maps? Cause they said initially there's not going to be any classic maps in here. If this game is supposed to last for ten fucking years, I better get Blood Gulch at some point. They're they're gonna they're just gonna make it like an event, like oh, Blood Gulch is back, Beaver Beaver Creek is if back. If Fortnite can do Blood Gulch, Halo Infinite can do Blood Gulch. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, uh, as far as classic maps go, I mean, there's really only like there's probably four maps that I think of when I think of Halo. Yeah. Uh, That's Blood Gulch, um, Beaver Creek. Zanzibar and uh, Valhalla are probably the three I immediate the three or four I immediately think of. Yeah, I would like to see all of those come. I mean, Valhalla. We basically have a spiritual sequel to Valhalla in terms of the fragmentation map for big team. Yeah. Um, I would like to see like Lockout or Guardian too. Lockout. I mean, like don't 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 get me wrong. Like we have evolved so much since Blood Gulch. Like, and I know like yeah, but kids today would load in and be like oh what's this and i'd be like the greatest fucking map like the most iconic <laughs> multiplayer map of all time is blood gold remember the portal that just shot you to the middle of the map <laughs> dude you remember shoddy snipers on it yeah everybody's everybody's out there invincible like i do uh, racing for the scorpion tanks like god dude there's just so many memories of blood gulch and coagulation that i have yeah and I, I get that we've moved way beyond that, but like bringing that back for a limited time event, I think would be a cool thing. Four v four on Beaver Creek, I think it, Beaver Creek still holds up, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, to this day, Valhalla still holds up. Zanzibar is one I would love to see Zanzibar come back as a big team map. I think that would still work. It's obviously smaller than any of the big team maps we have in Halo Infinite well, right now. That's but... part of the remastered maps in Halo 2, right? For the Master Chief Collection, Zanzibar? Yes. So, I mean, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the map is technically already built. I know it's not in this engine, but... I mean... I, I would I would like to see them brought back, even if it's just, like, once a year for, like, a classic play. Like, bring them back like you do Griff Ball. Just, like, you know, every couple of seasons, like, you rotate classic maps in. Yeah. I, I'd like to see it. But, like I said, if the Battle Pass is our biggest concern... We're doing okay right now. Like, Battle Pass, and I... Big Team Slayer, I think, is a, just an egregious oversight. But at the same time, I think it was, hey, we have a bunch of new types of gameplay. Or if you skipped Halo 5, you may not remember. You may not know how to do Strongholds or Total Control. Um, mm -hmm. Stockpile is a brand new thing. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to force you to learn these. And, okay, you did this. Here's your reward. Like, um, they had a whole suite of anniversary cosplay. I've given to you if you logged in this first week. Um, everybody's going to get the golden visor yeah. um, for the armor, uh, which I found out about literally 10 minutes after finishing my weekly challenges. <laughs> that did not feel great. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's 
God, dude, I can't wait. I can't wait for this campaign. This is going to be a blast in four-player co-op. Like, this sandbox feels so good. It feels so finely tuned already. And the audio design is incredible. Like, yeah. that Atmos sound is really coming through my headset. Every time you score on one of these maps, there's a giant AA cannon on one of them. And when it fires, it sounds like I'm standing next to it. Yeah. It's wild. Or, like, you hear the Infinity Fire or something like that on some of these maps. It's just... It's odd. You see uh, the Forerunner structures light up on um, Fragmentation when somebody scores. It It's awesome. It, it's just awesome. Like, when things come dropping in, if you're standing next to them, it sounds like they're dropping right next to you. Like You can see them shooting in. Um, this is... I, it, it, Halo is back. Halo what is back. What else can you say? Halo is back. Halo's and back. Course- it feels good. Plays good. Master Chief is back on top. Woo. Have you played Big Team with the Razorback? Have you used the Razorback, the non, uh, the non uh, Gatling gun Warthog? No. So it's basically the transport hog again. But if you use it, you can store weapons on the back. Yeah, I knew that. I knew that you could store weapons on the back. You can store the power cells on there too. We found out. Ooh. So we were Pro driving tip. it up there. We were loading them onto the back, and then everybody was grabbing one and jumping in, and we were driving off. We drove off like a whole wave of them doing that. That's and awesome. everybody else is still throwing them. We've leveled up two all the way before the other side even got one power cell because we just drove them off in those. That's awesome. Pro it tip. felt great. Like, yeah, pro tip, the, man, the, the hero moments. It's just like that's what it's here for. Like, I don't take it personally when I lose in a game like Halo because I don't have things at stake here. It's just like, oh, I'm leveling up. I'm leveling up a battle pass, which still feels really weird to be doing in Halo. Mm-hmm. But I like it. Like the battle passes don't expire. We said time and time again. Like Destiny needs to take a page out of this book. Never expiring battle passes. But Halo conversely needs to take one out of Destiny's book and be like, hey, you can level up your battle pass pretty quickly in Destiny. You need to be able to do that in Halo also. Even though this first season is going to last until May. I'm still like, uh, thank God you put all the reach armor in here because that's the only kind of armor I'd ever want for my Spartan. Mm -hmm. I want the Emil armor. And of course that means you have to get the level 95 for it out of a hundred. So I'll be playing a lot of this up until the anniversary event. And then I'll be kind of splitting my time 50, 50 between that and campaign before settling into multiplayer. I think free to play, I think it's really helped this game already. Even though you do not have an option in uh, casual, so on big team or in uh, quick play, you do not have the option to not play against mouse and keyboard. Um, you can disable that for comp, which feels really good being able to do that. So, mm. cool. Any other thoughts on Halo before we move on to the, the Chwab, though, Corey? No, I'm just. I mean, I've been obsessed. You know, I've been I've been playing it every free chance that i can get you know i just it's just right it's awesome i if you are looking for you know i mean it the big thing too is it's free to play so if you're looking for if you need a pvp itch and uh you're kind of wanting to take some time off of destiny before the 30th anniversary event this is uh this is a good one this is it yeah yeah so when are you gonna go play battlefield uh, which is completely broken, by the way. That's what so, I mean. yeah. So, all right, Josh. What do you say we get into the twab? The twab. I plan on this being a simple week. Last week we were like, okay, you know, we probably won't have any more any more big ones uh, until the anniversary comes out. And then literally the day after, they undermined me and said, oh, by the way, we've got another massive TWAB coming this week. Now we know next week. So next week, programming note, we'll remind you again at the end of the show. No episode next week. It's Thanksgiving in the States. We're not doing a show. Yeah. We are, we are taking a week off. That we there's are. not going to be much to talk about for Thanksgiving. Uh, the week after, though, we'll be back with... Unless course, there is, because we were expecting not a lot this week. They, they, no, they said here at the end, next week is going to be, it's going to be a very, very light one because everybody will be out of office for the holidays as well for them. Um, but then when we come back, I mean, as of today, Corey, as of this recording, we have 19 days until the anniversary. 19 of days off. until Master Chief invades Destiny. <laughs> God, that I'm not mentally prepared for like the insanity that week is going to bring. 
you we've got we've got the anniversary event so we've got the six player activity the the shores of Eter- we've got the shores of eternity we've got the uh zerd dungeon and the loot cave we've got thorn armor we've got gallerhorn we've got as luna we've got thousand yard stare coming back <sighs> Halo Infinite campaign comes out. The Game Awards happens. God knows what they're announcing there. The rumor is Hellblade 2 is one of the major things being shown there. Yep, I'm so uh, excited for that. In a God of War style reveal. Ah, I can't wait. I am, God, dude, that that three or four days is going to murder me. So I, I'm so excited. I'm so looking forward to it. But yes, this this twab. Th- can this is can I ask you something real quick board. before we start the twab? Hit me. What kind of game do you think Hellblade 2 is going to be? Uh, Probably somewhere in the middle between what Hellblade 1 was and what God of War 2018 was. Mm. Uh, okay. Because I do expect it to be more combat, or like have more combat in it rather than just hit A. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's going to be as linear and basically walk through as the first game. Like, you, there, there's room for both, right? Like we saw that with God of War. It has arguably the best story of this last generation and the best combat. Hmm. So you can definitely do it with that third person over the over the shoulder, never breaking right. the immersion right. thing. Uh, but I, I think that they got a really unique chance there. Like Ninja Theory is such a talented studio, but I want to see if they if Lightning can strike twice. That's the ultimate challenge here, I think. Yeah. Not not just is Senua a good character, like she is, she's a compelling character. Is there more to the story? Is right. there more to what makes her tick than what we saw in the first game? Because the first game almost felt kind of definitive there at the end. Yeah, but do you think the rumor is true that like Hellblade is more of a anthology style of her explore, like her having different personalities instead of like just the same character in this game? I would be okay with it. Yeah. Cause that's a that's I, the I, room that's been a rumor floating around. But anyways, sorry, I just wanted to because Hellblade is like the game that I really want to see because that's kind of like okay they've gotten you know they've gotten Flight Sim out they've gotten Age of Empires out they've gotten Forza and Halo out essentially like they've they've hit all the big guns right this is the first time that like outside of the franchises we really know that Microsoft is now in control of that is gonna you know be different so that's it okay twab time sorry hang on Uh uh-oh josh is reading intently sorry i i had a uh i had a family message i needed to reply to uh get this twab this is it's all sandbox it's it's split from last, last week we talked about guns perks damage things like that this week is all focused on abilities, on supers, on cooldowns, grenades, functionality, etc. There, this is probably more consequential than last week. I'm going to be completely honest. This this week's Schwab, the way the game will play now, like if you were to log in tonight versus December seventh, the evening of December seventh, is going to be night and day. They are making changes now that they say, hey, these are probably, and they say kind of upfront, these are probably going to feel a little bit bad at first. You're probably going to go, what the hell were you thinking? But the steps they're taking now are necessary for them to debut Void 3.0 with the Witch Queen. Um, so I think judging how we feel about some of these, and they, they say really clearly, like, nothing here is set in stone. We will be, we're going to be listening. This is why we're doing it three months ahead of time. We have three months to tune and tweak things for the Witch Queen. So without further ado, let's... Man, let's jump into this. Um, I don't. I don't even. I don't even know. Um, there, there's a couple paragraphs here from Kevin Yanes uh, up at the top. Um, you guys can go read that if you want to. Basically, he's just kind of recapping the year. Um, you know, we we got a lot of feedback about the Crucible earlier this year, and that's a lot of the changes here are very clearly meant to affect the Crucible. Um, And I like that. And one of the notes he makes here is earlier this year, we heard overwhelming feedback. The crucible has largely been dominated by ability usage. Players felt abilities were firing off too frequently with too much potency and too little investment. Agree. At its core, destiny is a game about space magic. So adjustments to our abilities must be made with care. We believe the changes we have made will keep the heart of it, make destiny's abilities fun intact while shaving down some of the excessive cases we've seen out there. 
It's important to reinforce here that part of Destiny's strength is that it's a live game and we're able to iterate and improve the game as it goes on. So, I like that. Uh, this is all in preparation for subclass 3.0, which, of course, we're getting Void with Witch Queen, and then it sounds like we're probably going to get Solar in the summer and Ark in the fall. Um, so, without further ado... Let's jump in. Uh, we're going to talk arc. It sounds like it seems like we're going to talk about arc abilities first. Um, that's where a lot of these changes are happening. <sighs> and th this is from Eric, who works on the sandbox team. Uh, we have changed the way ability cooldowns work. Up until now, cooldowns across individual ability types, grenade, melee, class, and super, have generally been identical across all abilities of the same type. For example, the grenades in Stace Destiny 2 share the same cooldown time, with the exception of Stasis grenades. The shared cooldown means all grenades need to have roughly the same power output because they have the same time cost. For the 30th anniversary, we've made a change that allows us to tune the cooldown of each ability separately. The best example of this is the Flux Grenade. Flux Grenade. Increased base cooldown from 82 seconds to 182 seconds. Oof. Woo! That's Increased a... attached detonation damage from 150 to 250 for a one-shot kill in PvP. Increased damage versus PvE combatants by 15% on top of base damage increase. Remove projectile tracking. Added small amount of aim assist. Throw speed increased by 117%. Oh, Sticks to all surfaces. As you can see, the Flux Grenade now has a lot, very long cooldown, but it's a one-shot kill in PvP if you manage to land it. It also hits harder in PvE. As a reminder, Flux Grenade is currently only available to Hunter Arc Striders. Now here's an example in the opposite direction. Firebolt Grenade. Firebolt Grenade. Reduced base cooldown from 82 seconds to 64 seconds. Damage per bolt reduced from 90 to 65. Increased damage versus PvE by 15%. Firebolt Grenade has low cooldown time, especially at Tier 10 Discipline, and also has low damage output. These kinds of varied cooldowns and power outputs should make the game feel more dynamic and give more depth to build crafting. To make build crafting around cooldowns easier, you will now be able to see the base cooldown time of your abilities when selecting them on the subclass screen. On the character screen, you'll see the actual cooldown time of your abilities as they're affected by your equipped ability and armor stats. All right, before, before we get on to the next part. I want to address that. Like, in, in theory, I want to address what the core of the next 15 minutes of discussion is going to be about abilities. Changing, being able to tweak individual uh, abilities, grenades, supers, etc. is going to be a running theme in today's TWAP. That is basically the whole TWAP, in a nutshell. The fact that we can go in and do this now is actually really, really important because for too long, I have made jokes about Hunter Grenades suck. Hunter Grenades, especially on Solar Glasses, are a fucking joke. Um, the Trip Mine is fine, but the, the uh, actually being able to kill somebody with a Trip Mine is actually not as easy as it sounds. You have to pretty much stick them, and even then it doesn't really work. Uh, kind of the same with the Vortex Grenades for the... Uh, Night Stalkers, and like I say, you know, the Flux Grenade is great, but I don't run Arc Strider. <laughs> a lot of people I know do not run Arc Strider, so when are we really using this? Right. Um, I like I, I like hearing this in theory. This is something that we're really going to see how it plays out, and I like that the emphasis is going to build crafting, but also that it seems like in terms of punishment – you're only being punished in PvP. Like, they really want you to build around your guns in PvP more than your abilities. It's not a race to see how fast can I spawn my grenade back or my uh, one-hit kill melees back. It's a race to see, okay, so I, want, I, gotta get my, I gotta get my time to kill better because that's gonna help fuel my abilities. My build is gonna help bring my abilities back. And primary weapon damage, as we're going to get to later on, is going to be the primary way that you're going to, no pun intended, is going to build your super the most efficiently. So with that taken into account, um, base cooldown time is actually the cooldown time at tier three of the relevant armor stat, strength, discipline, etc. This has become this because the system technically penalizes you for tanking your stats below tier three, in which case your cooldown will be longer than the base. We're looking at updating this to be more intuitive in a future release. 
Cooldown times for class abilities are not currently displayed due to a technical issue. We'll fix this in a future release. Um, it's a foundational change in preparation to move the light subclasses to subclass 3.0 that, that Stasis currently uses. For the 30th anniversary, we are using it to change the cooldown of nearly every ability in the game. One of the design goals this year was to reduce the amount of ability spam in the Crucible and fo put the focus on gunplay. We have made ability time cool, ability cooldown times longer on average than they were before. We don't want the PvE experience to suffer for the sake of PvP balance, though, so we've compensated where possible. For example, we've increased all grenade damage versus PvE opponents by 15% or more. This Ooh. should make grenades feel like bigger power moments than they do in today's game. Melee ability cooldowns haven't been increased quite as much as grenade cooldowns, and some of the less aggressive melee attacks have lower cooldowns than before. Class ability cooldowns have also generally increased, but the changes vary depending on which ability is equipped. Whew. All right. I, I do have a drink. I'm going to have to drink periodically. <laughs> I learned my lesson last week. I only had a sip of Coke when we started. I, I have a Gatorade ready to go this week. Yes, because Coke is the best thing to drink when you're getting ready to talk a lot. I, I know, right? I, sh I really should have been like drinking water and like hot tea. Once I saw this today, I should have been like preparing myself. Yeah. You should have done the uh, the lemon juice gargle that voice actors do. Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought about it. I genuinely thought about it. Um, so we're, we're going to jump right into it. Supers are the thing we're talking about here. Probably the most consequential outside of two class abilities. This is probably the most consequential thing talked about it, across both weeks of TWABs. I would say this is perhaps the most important thing. And it's going to be the hardest for people to not just grasp, but to accept, I think. Um so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna read it out. We're gonna have a discussion because um, I, I already have my my thoughts kind of formed on this. I was thinking about it on my drive home tonight. Uh, since Destiny's launch in 2014, super energy gain has been enti almost entirely passive. Your intellect stat dictates how quickly your super regenerates with a few other elements like orbs of power, armor, and weapon perks, and defeating targets as active sources. System worked well for a long time, but has issues that have grown more obvious as the game has evolved, and overall player skill, especially skill in evaluating how to play around their character build, has increased. Example, in modes like Trials of Osiris or Survival, where every life is precious, passive play becomes more common as players sit back and wait for their supers to close out a tied game. In general, we want the most efficient way to, be, to gain super energy to be actively engaging in combat. That doesn't mean you have to win every fight, but we want you to cry. We're making a big change to this system. Super regeneration will still have a passive component scaled by your intellect stat, but at a significantly reduced rate. On top of your passive regeneration, you will also gain super energy by dealing and taking damage to or from opponents. Here's a few key goals for this new system. In PvE, super uptime should be relatively unchanged from the live game, if not slightly higher. We're pretty happy with the frequency of supers in most PvE content and don't want to make big changes right now on that front. Good. That was my initial fear when I was reading that was, oh shit, Grandmasters are about to become way more difficult. I'm going to have to stand there for like 10 minutes waiting for my super to come back if I get to a boss room and don't have it. Uh, everybody should get at least one super in a 6v6 match that goes to score or time limit as long as they engage in regular combat. Expression of power through using your awesome space magic is a core part of what makes Destiny special, and we're not looking to change that. We think the cadence of supers in 6v6 modes is slightly too high, but we don't expect a dramatic change in super uptime for most players in playlists like Control or Iron Banner as a result of these changes. Supers should be less frequent in 3v3 modes than in the live game, where two supers per match is a fairly regular occurrence. These modes are expression of skill. We want that skill to be primarily about team coordination, positioning, intelligent use of abilities, and first and foremost, gunplay. While there is absolutely skill in outmaneuvering active supers or playing around super uptime, supers in general are purposely designed to be accessible power fantasies for all players that inherently creates asymmetry we need to account for in more competitive play. Primary weapon play should have a noticeable benefit in super energy regeneration. We're scaling energy gains up and down granularly based on the source of the damage, both outgoing and incoming. Outgoing primary weapon damage has a significantly higher return of super energy per damage point than any other type of damage. And different supers should come online at different times at a given match, and your super of choice should have an impact on how quickly it regenerates. Now that we have made the foundational change to differentiate cooldowns per individual ability, we want to address the super o'clock issue in the Crucible, where three minutes into a match, 12 supers are simultaneously popped and chaos breaks <laughs> out. We also want to open up build crafting space where your super's cooldown is an important element in your decision making beyond how high you want your intellect stat to be. So, 
let's di- let's digest these by their bullet points, right? Super uptime should be relatively unchanged from the live game and PVE, if not slightly higher. I think we both agree. There's no discussion to be had there. Good. Fantastic. If you're telling me I can get my super even a little bit quicker in uh, in things like Grandmasters and Raids? Fantastic. I love to hear it. I can't tell you how many times a stasis super in Gatekeepers on uh, Vault of Glass. I can't tell you how clutch it's been on Confluxes, stopping the overload champions that are running at me or the uh the the, the chicken vex the right chicken vex. I, i'm blanking on the name right now we're just gonna call them the chicken vex the yeah. big the big vex chickens that's fine um <laughs> I, I i think i think that that's pretty agreeable there right yes uh so this next bullet point though everyone should get at least one super in six on six that goes to score a time limit as long as they engage in regular combat. So one of the one of the concerns I've seen is, oh my god, this is putting us back to how Destiny 2 was at launch. Oh my god, like skilled players are just gonna stomp all over inexperienced players. And I I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Uh, that's not how I'm reading this. <laughs> how I'm reading this is, if you are skilled, you may get two supers around, but you're not gonna get like three or four. Yeah. Um. Like, basically, they did, They want you to play the game with the weapons you have and not just sit around and wait for heavy or wait for your shotgun to have ammo or, you know, fire off 30 handheld supernovas in a match. Like, the, the people that I'm seeing who are getting upset about this, I, by and large, feel rely too much on their abilities and not on actual gunplay. So, pretty on the surface, I think I'm okay with this. Um... The one that I really want to drive home is this third one. Uh, Super should be less frequent in three-on-three than in the live game, where two supers per match is a fairly regular occurrence. I agree. If that's really a mode about skill, your ability should be scarce. You should really have to think, do I want to use this here? And they're trying to force you into more gunfights. I think you're going to see an uptick in people going flawless or in them playing survival. Like, I will certainly be checking out survival more with these changes. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and I think it's more about okay, we want you to we want you to craft your build for PVE, but we don't want you to change up everything wherever you go. Right. Like you can use the same build in both, but just know when you go the the higher skill you go to in Crucible. So like control, yeah, the average player probably will still get close to two supers a match if they're regularly engaging in combat because you're getting it from dealing and taking damage. But, and it's also incentivizing primary usage, which we don't see a whole lot of that nowadays. Like, most people want to use their energy weapons, right? Right. But with this change, I think you're going to see... It's already rare for me to see supers in trials, even if you're stomping. Um, You're really only seeing in those matches that take forever, like both sides staying alive, running around in circles, getting getting reses, things like that. And you're really not seeing them pop off until you get to like round five or six. So with this, like I'm almost thinking like you may not see them, even if you're regularly engaging in gunplay, until like round eight. Which would be really nice because at that point, like if it's gone on that long... Yeah, you kind of earned earn the right to have a one-hit kill at that point, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> ah. oh, sorry, I had to take the first drink. Thirsty. That guy. Very thirsty. Uh, primary weapon play should have a notable benefit in super energy regeneration. Sure. You know, it, it's making you actually care about what you have for your primary now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and then super should come online at different times in a given match, which we're about to dive into. <laughs> uh, I like that they say here, we've separated supers into cooldown tiers that affect both the passive regeneration rate as well as the damage-based regeneration rate. This tiering was primarily influenced by each super's kill potential, where most one-off supers are unlikely to wipe a team or a room of combatants, but a long-lasting... Um, Oh, God, I just lost where I was saying. Uh, Long-lasting roaming super can and should have a trade-off as a result. We've also taken into account the general potency of the subclass kits where possible. 
For example, later on we'll discuss Shatter Dive and changes we're making which impact how effective the Revenant Hunter is in a neutral game, causing us to shift some of that potency to the Super's uptime as a result. It's important to stress this is the first iteration of this system. Where any given super will fall into the recharge rate tiers will change over time as we continue to tune. These are the regeneration rate tiers we are launching with on December 7th. Tier 5, the fastest regeneration, Well of Radiance. I expect to see a pretty significant uptick of that one in uh, Iron Banner. Tier 4, this this is the one I think that is going to make a lot of people upset. Mm -hmm. Blade Barrage and Silence and Squall. <laughs> Um, I will say Silence and Squall is, pr unless you're chucking it directly onto like a capture point, is pretty easy to just like outmaneuver. Yeah. Um, like you may get hit on that initial activation, but that's pretty much a, hey, I got one kill. It's worth it. Yeah. Um, unless you're dumping it onto a point like that is I, I run it in both PvP and PvE. But yeah, let's not pretend like occasionally you'll get real lucky in trials if they're all grouped up together. I'd be lying if I said that that hasn't helped me clutch some victories. Um, tier three, so kind of the middle. Uh, Shadow Shot, Burning Maul, Arc Staff, Nova Bomb, and Thunder Crash. Um, so again, a lot of basically one-use supers. Uh, though, those seem to be the ones in tier four and three. Is a lot of these ones you can only use once, and then you got to regen. So tier three is probably where most of us are falling, right? Like in in PvP, I do see a fair amount of Nova Bombs, Thunder Crashes. I still see those pretty frequently. And I would say Silent and Squall I see from Hunters a fair amount. Uh, tier 2, Golden Gun, Chaos Reach, Nova Warp, Storm Trance, Daybreak, Sentinel Shield. Um, <clears throat> I think putting Daybreak here is probably the most important one uh, in terms of where it should be. I would not be shocked if that gets moved down to Tier 1 eventually just because of how dominant it is. Um Daybreak is, uh, that's the uh, flame uh, top tree dawn blade. Top and bottom tree dawn blade is what that is. Um, and then tier one, slowest regeneration, spectral blades, fist of havoc, hammer of soul, glacial quake, and winter's wrath. Very happy winter's wrath and spectral blades are down there also, because those are, pr I would say, pretty dominant supers as well. Mm -hmm. Um if you see those, you're simply not getting out of the way. I can beat a Fist of Havoc Titan or a Hammer of Soul Titan if I play it right, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's really no outplaying Winner's Wrath. If it shoots at you, you're you're fucked, yeah. and you can cross the whole map with that oh, super. Yeah, yeah. Um, that super is still like, gosh, it's so. I I don't understand it's Titans good, that don't but use it's it. Less dominant than it was. I don't see it as much. I actually see a fair amount of Storm Trances and Dawn Blades now. Um, <clears throat> and then they say that this sets us up for the future as we move towards 3.0. As an example, for the anniversary, things like Deadfall and Mobius Quiver variants of Shadow Shot will say, share the same cooldown tier, but with the Void 3.0 launch, they could exist in different tiers based on their potency. By that same token, Ward of Dawn, which is currently tied to Sentinel Shield's cooldown, will be moved to the Tier 5 group as a standalone super with Void 3.0. Super important there. Like, to differentiate that, hey... We're not, once Witch Queen comes out, we are not going to punish you for the Sentinel Shield cooldown. You will be able to pop that bubble as regularly as humanly possible. So I, again, I expect to see an uptick of that when we come back and we're doing things like Iron Banner and the Witch Queen. I expect mm -hmm. that and, um, well, Radiance to be used a lot. But also conversely, that, and I, I see why they did this, you should be allowed to counterplay that also with, things like Blade Barrage and Silence and Squall. Like, it's a game that's all about balance, ultimately. And I know, like, these are not going to be popular changes, but I, I, I want to stress and urge, just like with some of the changes that happened this year, where it seemed like the sky was falling based on Twitter and Reddit's reactions, let's see how this plays out first, and then we'll make some judgment calls. Like, you, you're not going to be able to make a judgment call based off, like, three Crucible matches. Yeah. Like, this is going to take a little while. It's going to take people who are much smarter than me figuring out, is this actually a good change or a bad change? All I can do, I'm, I'm just an asshole with an opinion at the end of the day. So, oh, God, this is this is just so long. Um, man, we've, been, we've been going for so long. I know. Um, 
we are not even ladies and gentlemen we are not even halfway done with this right now um god now i gotta find where i was uh talk about non-super abilities uh, what they're, uh, we're not going to go over what their, what their goals are. Uh, we've talked about a lot of those, you know, weapons, primary way players, players will engage the combat, non super abilities, uh, accentuate or augment the combat, but should not solve an encounter by themselves, blah, blah, blah. We have two PVP. Okay. So I, I want to, I want to make this really clear right here because this is something I missed in my initial reading. And I was really, really worried about, because I've already seen some misinformation going around about this one specifically. Mm -hmm. With the 30th anniversary, we have taken a pass at significant number of these elements. Across subclass perks, armor mods, and exotic armor pieces, we have tuned PvP energy regeneration separately from their base PvE values, which we are not changing. That is bolded, that is highlighted, and I'm glad that I read that again because I missed that my first couple times through this. I I was prepared to freak out over the Hunter Dodge mm -hmm. later on in this episode, full disclosure. This is very reassuring to me because um, that is just – that is yeah. a, a tool that is invaluable during PvE encounters in my opinion. Yeah. Um, we want Buildcraft to be rewarding, but in its current state, the com combational – I don't know how to pronounce that nature of these perks and items leads to an unsustainable ability energy economy that diminishes weapon play in PVP for this tuning pass. We focus primarily on items that feed in the self perpetuating loops of ability energy gains. Here is a list of the affected items. So this is all going to be really long, uh, neutral <laughs> game perks in subclasses. These perks have had their ability energy regeneration reduced by 50% in PVP. We targeted perks that can either activate out of combat with a single button press or those which were returning amounts of ability energy that were significantly out of band. Among those, Whisper of Shards, Arc Web, Rising Storm, Ionic Traces, Electrostatic Surge, Aftershocks, Inertia Override, Benevolent Dawn, Practice Makes Perfect, Dark Matter. Um, you can look those up. Um, a lot of these are Warlock ones. Uh, there's a couple Titans and there's one Gunslinger one in there and a Stasis Fragment. But a lot of these are Warlock ones. Mm -hmm. Subclass in Super Perks. These perks scale down from uh, scale down energy returns as you get kills in your Super, i.e. first kill while in Super returns more Super energy than third kill. These perks often result in Supers being able to roam the map for much longer than is healthy for the game. And that means a victim can frequently die to an active Super, respawn on her side of the map, and be killed by that same Super again. Hello, Fists of Havoc. Uh, I really hate that. That and uh, uh, Dawnblade. I get killed by those a lot. We've rescaled this energy refund decay more aggressively in PvP so that the minimum energy refund is reached roughly twice as quickly. No change has been made to the refund decay against PvE combatants. And the two things affected here are Everlasting Fire for Dawnblades and Trample for Striker Titans. Exotic... <laughs> <laughs> exotic armor each exotic below had a custom tuning pass focused on their ability energy return in pvp um frost ee5s heart of inmost light controverse holds doomfang pauldrons shinobu's vow crown of tempest and the stag um i will let you guys go read these on your own um the 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 three that we're going to address very quickly Heart of Inmost Light, Ability Energy Regeneration Scalers Reduced by 50% in PvP. Uh, this was reworked, so activating multiple abilities will now reliably result in multiple empowered stacks. The stacking behavior was previously a bug, but it seemed like a good opportunity to promote it to a feature. Um, so that seems like a positive change. Despite the 50% nerf, this sounds like a positive change in some ways. Yeah. Um, I don't personally use that. I don't play a Titan. Corey, can you speak to that one at all? I know you use that... Uh, exotic pretty regularly i use it uh i mean i'm not using it probably in the way that it's supposed to be but it does help when i play pvp but man 50 percent uh i mean that besides the 50 percent uh nerf it it looks it looks like it's going to benefit the exotic right but man the 50 percent man i mean i could see like 20 percent but man 50 percent that's like a that's a big difference. 
Yeah, it's uh, it seems pretty but, drastic, and I'm curious to see how this one plays I, out. I also I also wonder if it's a way for them to get Titans to use other exotics because I do see this a lot from Titans in PvP. I, I, I think it is. Um, we're actually about to hit on another Titan exotic. <clears throat> is our second one here, uh, Doomfang Pauldrons. Mm-hmm. Reduced super energy gain on activation when an opposing player is killed by a void melee by 50%. No change in PvE. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our last one here, uh, the Stag. We've seen that one used an awful lot this season on Warlocks. Yeah. Reduced class ability, energy refund on shield break by 50% in PvP. No change in PvE. So it's still going to be top tier PvE, but it will not be quite as dominant in Trials of Osiris. Yeah. Um. And then, God, <sighs> armor mods. In general, we've reduced energy returns from those from these mods by roughly 50% in PvP, depending on the number of copies of the mod you have slotted. And these are melee kickstart, grenade kickstart, utility kickstart, perpetuation, bolstering detonation, focusing strike, bomber, outreach, dynamo, distribution, momentum transfer, and impact induction. This is a big foundational shift for us, and we expect to do a lot of tuning as time goes on. So, as always, we'll be on the lookout for how things are feeling across the game, and we'll adjust accordingly. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to have to go and re- especially, like, I, PvP mains, people who like to play a lot of Trials, a lot of Iron Banner, a lot of Survival, are really going to have to play with new loadouts here. Like, for people like me, I, I really don't change too much of my stat distribution between game modes, just because... I have a pretty. I feel like I have a pretty well-rounded guardian. Um, my biggest thing is like when I switch from stasis to solar, I have to have an armor piece or two to compensate for the extra things I'm losing off of my stasis fragments for right now. Um, but all right, I think I think we've reached about the halfway point or slightly over it. Now we've got we've got class specific, we've got class specific changes now. Uh, stasis crystals, stasis crystals do a lot. On top of freezing players when they're created, they're also they also block line of sight, block movement, and act as explosive barrels. It's too much for PvP. With this release, stasis crystals will now slow players instead of freezing them, and they'll do much less damage to players when they detonate. Good. Uh, this is basically all built around shatter dive. Is yeah. what I'm gathering. Mm-hmm. Shatter dive and. Uh, Behemoth Titans seem to be the two that are really going to be hit by this. Yeah. As far as PvE is concerned, Stasis Crystals will still freeze combatants, and we've increased Stasis Crystal detonation damage versus PvE combatants. Looking at the numbers, it was almost always better to shoot directly at a combatant instead of at a crystal near a combatant. This change should help Crystals better live out their explosive barrel dreams. So Crystals, while forming, Crystals now slow nearby players instead of freezing them. They still freeze PvE combatants while forming. Increased slow freeze radius while forming from 1.75 meters to 2.6. Reduced crystal detonation damage versus players by 55%. Increased detonation damage versus PvE combatants by 60%. Increased crystal detonation radius from 6 to 8 meters. On on the surface, that all sounds really good. Um, I don't think any of us are going to argue with it. I think we're all tired of being shattered dived at this point. I'm tired of stasis. (laughs) I, I stasis i don't shatter dive and i still really like stasis so i, take I just that meant like you. certain situations in pvp it just i'm not tired of stasis the ability especially in like pve and stuff like i think it's really helpful but just like man and i know it, i know it's gotten better over the last couple months but god people still know how to use it it's just like god so anyway that's my five second complaint <laughs> Uh, moving on to the classes specifically, we're going to talk Hunter. This is this is the one that I I think we need to have a discussion about. Uh, both of these, actually. Uh, I think we have less to talk about when it comes to Warlocks, or and slightly less when it comes to Titans. But dodge. In order to meet the goal of less ability spam in the Crucible, we're reducing how often Hunters can dodge. Gambler's Dodge is getting hit the hardest out here because it completely circumvents melee ability cooldown times. It also completely changes the Hunter silhouette in PvP, making it very powerful. In addition, Hunter Dodges will no longer break projectile tracking, meaning it's less of a get-out-of-jail-free card when a tracking rocket or slow-moving projectile is flying towards you. This is the one I was concerned that was going to be nerfed in PvE, but I, I, if I'm taking them at their word, this these are still going to work in PvE the way they always have. 
but I have no idea. Like this, this is this is the main change I need to play in order to see how it actually feels. Hunter Dodge no longer breaks projectile tracking, and for Marksman Dodge, Tier 10 mobility cooldown increased from 11 seconds to 14 seconds. Base cooldown is unchanged at 29 seconds. That's typically the one I'm using as Marksman because I dodge to reload my uh, heavy weapons during boss encounters quite often. Gambler's Dodge. Tier 10 mobility cooldown increased from 11 seconds to 18 seconds. Base cooldown increased from 29 to 38 seconds. Um, good. I, I cannot tell you the amount of times I have lost a firefight because somebody has dodged out of my line of sight, and it's infuriating. Um, as somebody who plays a hunter, it's infuriating when somebody out-hunters me. So, selfishly, I like this change. Um, I use Gambler's Dodge anyways, even in PvP. Um... Or, uh, excuse me, Marksman's Dodge, not Gambler's, uh, because I like the auto-reloading of it all. <laughs> and I, I cannot tell you how much that has helped me with heavies, or if I happen to be running a linear fusion or something like that, like how much this has really helped me. Um, and then the Reven Revenant Hunters. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> You guessed it. The stasis crystal change is detailed earlier means that the Revenant Shatter Dive will now almost never kill a full health guardian. Shatter Dive may still kill if the hunter is using Whisper of Fishers, Touch of Winter, and the target is at the very center of all six crystals, but that has to be an incredibly rare in our playtesting. We can all agree Shatter Dive was too powerful. We tried a number of fixes over the past few releases, but the truth is that as long as stasis crystals froze players and shatter dive shattered players, it was going to be too good. But not it's not all rain clouds and puddles for shatter dive hunters. The increase in stasis crystal damage versus PVE makes shatter dive a great choice in PVE. On top of that, we're increasing shatter dive damage versus frozen combatants by a hundred percent. Have fun melting frozen monsters. Much less lethal versus players due to stasis crystal changes. Le more lethal versus combatants due to crystal changes. Increased shatter dive damage versus frozen PvE combatants by 100%. Cool. I might actually play with this now. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough to try and use this in PvE. I, I also just really like my dusk fields. But I may try this out in some lower level PvE activities. I don't think that I'll be taking off my, uh, my dusk fields for GMs. But this may be fun on some uh, some Master Nightfalls occasionally, or in some raids. I could see myself using this. And then the Grim Harvest aspect increased fragment slots from two to three. Uh, there's some changes to uh, Top Tree Arc Strider. The change to the combination blow melee was made possible by our variable ability cooldown systems. Top Tree Arc Striders previously were basically required to use Gambler's Dodge with this tree. We hope this change will make this ability viable, even if you're using Marksman Dodge. Combination blow, reduced base cooldown duration from 96 seconds to 15 seconds. Jeez. And then bottom tree, Night Stalker. Th this is a big one for me. Vanish and Smoke Melee has low damage output but high utility. Data shows this subclass tree is struggling in PvP, so we decided to increase how often Pathfinder Hunters can go invisible. Reduced base cooldown from 96 seconds to 75 seconds. Um, I am excited for this. <laughs> I occasionally have to use this in uh, in raids. I have to take us uh, invisible to run the Gorgon Maze. Right. So I'm excited for this change. I'm less excited to see invisible hunters running around in trials now. Yeah, that seems um, like a big thing you're going to see from now on. I, I don't think it'll be nearly as bad as Shatter Dive, but yeah, it's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be great. I guess we'll find out. Um, yeah, well. We will we will find out together, um, ba based on Josh's raging of trials from the anniversary weekend. <laughs> um, but let's shift gears for a second. Let's move let's move on to Titans. There actually is a fair amount here for Titans. Uh, they have one thing that's just as consequential as the dodge, which we're going to hit first: shoulder charge. In an effort to put emphasis back on gunplay, we decided to reduce the number of abilities that can one-shot a full health guardian. As such, the Titan's three shoulder charges are no longer one-shot abilities in PvP. Thank God. God. Hmm. Thank God. But to balance this out, we made not shoulder happy. charges quicker to activate, easier to hit with, and travel farther. God damn it. <laughs> You give me good news, and then you immediately ruin it. Immediately ruined. Okay, uh, but we, but look, sprint activation, 0.25 seconds, that's, that's not a lot of time. 
Okay. That's 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 not going to be noticeable when you're sprinting down the map. Well, I guess it's time to get good. Target cone increased by 10%. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I guess I I do I do like the the note here. Uh we've also increased the damage in PvE. Um in our experience, they're still powerful in PvP in combination with short range weapons and when used as a movement tool. We want to curb shoulder ch shoulder charges potency now that we've tuned down shotguns as their current counter. We've been monitoring data and feedback and adjusting accordingly. This this feels like the ultimate we're prepping for the subclass 3.0 change. Yeah. More than anything else, uh, because you'll probably be able to pair this with another ability or even swap it out. Yeah. Um, this this feels like it's very much there because this was this was a high risk, high reward ability to use. I think we can all agree on that. Like I saw it mostly in six v six. It was very rare that I saw it in three v three, just because that's so much riskier. They would only do it if they could completely blindside you, basically. Um, so I, I personally, on paper, I think this change is good. I'm deferring to you and Joe and A1 Johnny to tell me if this is any good. Um, I know I, I want to read exactly what John sent me earlier about this. Uh, I got to scroll back through some things here. Um, I'd assume shoulder charge would, be, would need to be nerfed with the updating updated light subclasses. Every Titan subclass is based around the shoulder charge. Either you can shoulder charge or you can have a good super neutral game, never both. Uh, but with the rework, you'd be able to equip shoulder charge with whatever else you wanted. Uh, I, I like that a lot. I, I think that the versatility of the, the Titan melee abilities combined with changes to other coming to grenades and just as we've seen this with the stasis builds, you know, how much we can change everything on its head. Like a grenade can spawn an ice wall now for God's sake. Like who knows what we're going to get with void 3.0 that they haven't told us about yet. We do only know a couple of the new abilities. Um, this, this excites me. I think this gives the option to put in other melee abilities also. Like you have hammer strike on solar Titans, but what if you could, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know if you could change that. Like, what if instead of shield bashing somebody, you could chuck a shield at them? Just one one shield throw, like Captain America style, bounce it off them and then finish them with a sidearm. That seems to me like sidearms, shotguns, like those are going to be a lot of the things you're going to want to use with these changes to shoulder charges. Like, boom, here's a shotgun, like shotgun pellets from afar to break the shield, and then bam, you're you're covering that distance because... When you take a look at the distance you're doing, your your range is increasing by about a meter and a half on all shoulder charges. Uh, and that's big. AoE damage may be reduced, but the base cooldown and the base cooldown is also slightly increased. Um, hammer strike, reduced direct impact damage from 170 to 120. Um, but now that you can pick that back up, that's I don't think that's as big of a deal, personally, with the hammer assault. Like I said, like this is... The, these can almost be akin to finishing moves in a lot of ways, like as close as we can get to finishers in the Crucible. Um, barricade. Even with Rally Barricade changes we made this season using this ability during a firefight, is still a risky proposition. We spaced out the cooldowns of the two barricades to make the choice slightly more interesting. Towering Barricade, base cooldown duration has been increased from 37 to 40 seconds. Rally Barricade, reduced duration from 37 to 32 seconds. Behemoth Titans. We agree with the general community feedback that Behemoth could use some love in PvE. We're hoping changes to Diamond Lance makes this aspect a top-tier PvE pick. Shiver Strike is getting a big damage buff during the Glacial Week or during the Glacial Quake. Not Glacial Week, super. Whisper of Change Fragment buff is here is also very spicy and should help the Behemoth survivability in Pinnacle PvE activities. And Whisper of Change can be used by all size subclasses, but making crystals is kind of the Behemoth's thing. Diamond Lance. Increased Fragment Slots from 1 to 3. Now spawns a Diamond Lance upon killing a PvE combatant with a Stasis Weapon. Killing three players with Stasis Weapons in a single life. Killing an enemy with a Stasis Ability. Shattering an enemy. The amount of Titans that are going to be running around with Aegir Scepter in Pinnacle PvE, I can't wait to see. This is going to be fantastic. I'm very excited to see this. John, John mentioned that to me earlier. Uh, he, he goes, I can now make... 
Uh, Diamond Lances, every time I kill someone with a stasis gun, holy shit, I'm going to have a lot of fun with Agers. Um, that is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I would also wager that's pro those Diamond Lances are probably a one-hit kill in PvP. Um, I can't imagine them not being after all that you have to go through to even generate one. Um, Shiver Strike damage increased while in Glacial Quake by 50%, and Whisper of Chains increased damage resistance versus PvE combatants from 25% to 40%. Yeah, Behemoth is Behemoth is going to be a semi-viable option now in PvE, I think. I don't know about Pinnacle, like they say here. I think you might still need a little bit more of a buff, but definitely in anything below a Master Nightfall, you should be able to use this. In Dungeons, you should be able to use this viably. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the best option for you is another conversation entirely. I'm, I'm still going to go out and say it's not the best option, but if it's something you want to play around with, I bet people who use this... If you can build craft correctly, this is a good option. Yeah, that that's what I was getting at. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, there are some changes. The bottom tree striker here. Bottom tree striker, this class is dominating PvP this season, so we're tuning it down a notch. The changes we made to Fist of Havoc helped the top tree as intended, but they also turned bottom tree into a monster. On top of that, stasis nerfs and other changes we've made over the past few releases created a power vacuum that Striker bot, <laughs> Striker bot, uh, Striker, bottom tree Striker filled with extreme prejudice. We hope these changes put Striker back into the pack instead of a towering high above everyone else. Knockout, melee lunge range and melee damage bonus now deactivate after a melee kill. Trample. Super energy gain from Fist of Havoc Light Attack now decays to a minimum amount over three PvP kills, down from seven. Full frontal assault, or frontal assault, not full frontal. Oh, uh, melee increase. <laughs> this is not a rated X podcast. Um, <laughs> increased base damage from 82 seconds to, or base cooldown from 82 to 106 seconds. And Fist of Havoc Heavy Slam Radius now reduced from eight to six uh, meters bottom tree only. Uh, so those could be some. Uh, some spicy changes there. Uh, I like that. Uh, John's already excited to be maining top tree striker. Uh, and I think that does it for, for Titans. Corey, is there anything else you wanted to touch on these Titan changes as our token Titan? Um, I mean, not really. I don't, I don't really play striker Titan all that much. I, mm -hmm. I think at some point I just got tired of striker Titan because I mean, Obviously, in Destiny 1, that's what you start with, and then in Destiny 2, you right. know. But I I mostly play a Sentinel and with us, you know, usually playing secondary uh, uh, Solar Titan. So, I mean, the Striker stuff is like, yeah, it's cool, but I don't use it anyway, so these nerfs aren't going to affect me, really. But mm -hmm. I, especially to this bottom tree, I just, I I would rather, you know, play as one of the other titans is all okay that, that's fair that's fair totally agree there this is our last section finally the warlock warlock changes warlock uh uncharged melees for walks warlocks have been losing slap fights for far too long yes up until now warlocks haven't been able to melee back to back as quickly as titans and hunters no more with the 30th anniversary warlocks will be able to melee just as quickly as titans and hunters we're also removing the one meter range extension warlocks receive to compensate. We still think the idea of each class having unique abilities to their melee is interesting, but we want to do it in a way that won't cause one class to constantly lose slap fights. Maybe someday in the future. Uncharged melee reduced melee range from 5.5 to 4.5 to match Hunter and Titan. Reduced suppression time after melee can now melee back to back at the same speed. Middle tree Voidwalker. In our effort to do away with one-shot abilities that are frustrating to be hit by, Handheld Supernova is also getting the shoulder charge treatment. That's right, Handheld Supernova no longer one-shots in PvP. To compensate, it now travels farther and pushes enemies back. We've also increased the damage of Handheld Supernova and Nova Warp versus Champion and Boss Combatants. We had increased their damage in Season of the Lost, but felt like they could use even more juice. So, Handheld Supernova now deals 150 damage max. Increased damage versus champions and bosses by 30%. Increased projectile range from 12 to 14 meters. Now pushes targets away from the Warlock on detonation. And Nova Warp increased damage versus champions and bosses by a whopping 30%. Holy shit. Very excited. Very, very, very excited. Uh, that That's going to be 
that's gonna be fun to see. I've seen definitely I've, an uptick in Nova Warp, and I want to see it in PVE more. I really feel like they're tr- really trying to make the Warlock and not the butt of every Destiny joke now. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I don't last... think the, I don't know if the Warlocks were the butt of the jokes. I think that I think the Hunters have definitely moved in the pole position on that one. I I just mean like we we've been making fun of our hunter or our warlock friends for so long it's just like i don't know to me it just, i think we make jokes at our friends that are warlocks that it just feels like they're really aiming to make the warlocks better is all i'm not saying they aren't bad aren't good i'm just saying that's what it feels like to me hi nerd generalist i'm talking about you <laughs> Um, the final, the final big change here, shade binders. We feel shade binder is in a pretty good place with a couple of exceptions. One winter's wrath is still the best super for shutting down other supers. And it's not even close. Winter's wrath must now freeze and shatter other supers twice to kill them. As a general rule, roaming supers should not be able to one shot other supers. Two, Penumbral Blast Melee is too difficult to land against PvE combatants. We made the ability harder to land in PvP. It had a negative effect on PvP, or PvE. God. We've increased the proximity detonation radius against PvE to make it easier to land. All three stasis grenades now have different cooldown times, so we made a change to Bleak Watcher to avoid a situation where it was always best to use the grenade with the shortest cooldown time. This results in an overall cooldown increase for Bleak Watcher, which fits its incredibly high power output. Winter's Wrath reduced Shatter Pulse damage versus enemy supers. Must not generally freeze and shatter all supers twice to eliminate. Penumbral Blast increased proximity detonation radius versus PvE combatants by 100%. And Bleak Watcher, while it is equipped, all stasis grenades charge at Glacier Grenade rate. Uh, good. That was I think that was the one last remaining complaint any of us had about stasis outside of Shatter Dive was, holy shit. Winter's Wrath is just dominant. If you have a super up and Winter's Wrath comes up, if you can't kill that thing immediately, you're dead. You yep. will die. Yep. And that just that feels really bad. Um, it's it's a load of crock. I think even trying to like counter freeze them didn't always work because they just are flying around the map. Um, so I I'm a big fan of this selfishly. Uh, this is this is kind of in the wait and see camp for me. I don't know if they're going to have to walk this back or not because I know Bungie's faced a lot of criticism, rightfully so in a lot of ways, for letting Stasis come in too powerful and then just nerfing the shit out of it and never going back. Uh, we kind of saw that with the Behemoth, right? And they're finally coming back to Behemoth to make it a viable option again. Like Winter's Wrath was at least still viable in Master Nightfalls and even in... Uh, in GMs, we use it a lot purely for the stasis turrets. Um, if we if it's a boss where we don't think we're going to need to have super damage on it, that I can't tell you how much those turrets have saved our lives over the past you know year. Uh, it's it's been awesome. I'm glad that none of that's being touched. That is by far I think the most valuable stasis ability right now in any mode is the stasis turret of the warlock. Um. We have now reached the end of this incredibly, incredibly, incredibly in-depth sandbox change. So one final note. There are a bunch of other small changes coming in the 30th anniversary, but we will cover everything else in the official patch notes. As you can see, the team has been hard at work adjusting sandbox globally. We hope the picture we're painting here reinforces statements we've made in the past. The sandbox is going to evolve alongside the game. As we go into year five and beyond, this statement will become even more true with new and exciting changes coming with subclass 3.0. Man, feels good. I like it. Between this and the uh, weapon changes we got last week, this sounds like it's going to not just, this sounds more akin to an annual release and not a seasonal release. Right. Um, so I'm really excited for this. And they're, right. they're going to say it, that, or Damage said it on Twitter and on Reddit, I believe him and Cosmo both did, saying that nothing is set in stone here. Yeah. But. I mean, we've talked about this all season. If we're going to change the sandbox and they're going to experiment and they're going to do these things, this is the season to do it so they can launch the Witch Queen in a place that is great for all players, you know? Right. And they're, they're taking the steps for subclass 3.0 already, you know, thinking ahead, you know, thinking, okay, we had to start planning this like six, nine, six to nine months ago. We can execute midway through the season 
and fine tune. Like we're already seeing some things like, Hey, we did some changes this season and they like Nova warp and it wasn't enough. So we want to give it a little bit more juice in PVE and they're going, they're going to go nuts with it. Right. Um, I, I think, I think that this just sounds really, really good. Uh, big fan, big, big fan. Yeah. There is one final note in this twab. Um, we have a little bit at the end to cover, but, um, Woo! Destiny 2 is leaving Xbox Game Pass. This is really bothering me. Um, the I understand why the expansions are leaving, but the fact that the actual like New Light game is leaving Game Pass is kind of a sore subject for me. Um, I was really enjoying this being on there and being able to play it anywhere, and now I'm like, well, shit. Uh, I guess I'm traveling with a Series S? Question mark. Yeah. Or hoping that, because I was really looking forward to being able to bang out some of the anniversary event on vacation over Christmas. And now it's like, uh, well, I guess that's not happening. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, are they going to, is Xbox going to allow you to play the games eventually in your library that you own? I do think that's the ultimate goal is for that to happen. Um, because if you're going to expand the TVs and stuff, you can't just leave it on game pass permanently. Right. Like that, not the game pass isn't a great library, but I mean, people want to play things like call of duty. Yeah. They want to play things like battlefield that aren't part of game pass. Yeah. Like I like, don't get me wrong. I like that. I can access halo anywhere in the world and I'll always be able to, that's great. And I'm not saying like, this is great for a multiplayer experience. Like cloud gaming, I think still has a long way to go. We're probably about, I would say, 18 to 24 months off from really having great multiplayer over cloud. Uh, but who knows with the rate that they've really stepped up the cloud gaming experience this year uh, with Xbox. But <sighs> December 8th, Destiny 2 and its expansions, Forsaken Shadow Keeping Beyond Light, will leave Game Pass on console and cloud. Destiny 2 and current expansions will res- remain on Game Pass for PC because they literally just came there. Uh, once Destiny 2 leaves Game Pass, players who not who do not own any of the expansions on Xbox will lose access to campaign, expansion-specific activities, raids, dungeons, hunts, Exo Challenge, Nightfall, and Trials of Osiris, the Stasis subclass, the Middle Tree supers for each subclass, and the 10% off perk for silver purchases and other game add-ons. Items such as exotics already acquired will still be available for players who earned them. Previously purchased season passes will remain active. Players who wish to continue playing Destiny 2 on Xbox should look for Destiny 2 expansion discounts that will be available soon. And as a reminder, The Witch Queen will not be on console or PC Game Pass when it launches on February 22nd, 2022. Um, All that's fine and good. I just, I guess I just would like an explanation for why the base game is going to leave Game Pass. Yeah. That's when it's a free to play game. Technically, that's a little aggravating to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe it has to do. I don't know. Maybe it has to do with the expansions or something like that. Um, maybe. Maybe it's more technical than any of us realize. But that, I don't know. It's just it's a frustrating thing. I, I would really love that. And I mean, that ten percent silver discount did help a little bit. I know. Um, it was only a couple bucks, but. I mean, come on. look, when you're buying like twenty five bucks worth of silver, that that three to five four dollars that you're saving is a big deal yeah and i mean i'll still continue to use my microsoft reward points to pay for mine so yeah. it's not the end of the world but it is a little aggravating uh it's literally leaving the day after the anniversary drops yeah which is also like lol well um <laughs> oh man cool <laughs> oh god my throat is so dry um i think that's it um and I'm, I'm making sure there's nothing at the end um there's not uh next week short and sweet twab um and yeah uh that that's all damage really has for us at the end is uh you know it's going to be a really short twab next week for thanksgiving uh december 3rd I expect that we'll finally get details about what weapons are coming back. They're going to want to leave surprises. 
Uh, damage has confirmed. You know, him and Cosmo were talking about it on Reddit and Twitter earlier. There are still a lot of things they haven't told us about the anniversary. Like, we may have gotten a lot of sandbox updates, but there are still sandbox updates they haven't told us. There's a lot of stuff they haven't told us about what's coming, what's returning, et cetera, et cetera, that they're keep working hard to keep a secret. And I, I'm looking forward to this. We should have an API update sometime in the next week or two with one of these big uh, maintenance downtimes. Um, because today in Destiny, who regularly data mines the Eververse items, uh, has said that they, they are basically out of information at this point. Um, they only have it up through Thanksgiving, I believe. Hmm. If, I, if I'm looking at this correctly, that's, that's as far as their calendar goes. Um, yeah, next, next week will be the last week that they have data for, the, uh, the 23rd. So probably on the 30th uh, is when the API changes will start going live. And I, I'm curious to see what that brings. Um, hopefully nothing gets ruined for us, um, either via Eververse, mining, or um, raid secrets. <laughs> uh, the anniversary event's been a long time coming, right? And for that to be happening alongside Halo is just massive they can't be understated like my two favorite shooters ever are both getting basically brand new games in a 24-hour span hmm. so cool you you have to wonder if the anniversary event like if they're going to do more things like that in the future as like i don't know mid-year expand like i'm not saying i want that but if they have plans to do more of those in the future and that may be why the the free version is leaving things like game pass mm -hmm. but i'm not sure yeah, it's. I mean, it's still sad. It still sucks. But I really liked playing De Destiny on like a uh, cloud when I was like laying in bed or something. Sometimes I I, ha I have enjoyed at least being able to like run to the tower or do like seasonal events, uh, go bang out a couple like daily bounties or something, yeah. um, playing on my backbone. But <sighs> alas, uh, it is what it is. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see it come back sometime next summer. We do know games that leave Game Pass aren't always gone forever. We're, we've already seen, you know, some indies that left like a year ago are now back, coming back to the service. Uh, we've seen it with Grand Theft Auto V has done it. It's it's gone away, it's come back, and it's gone away again. Red Dead Redemption's done it. Uh, I think Destiny's probably going to fit into that model. Like, oh, maybe they're on, uh, that'll happen. Because I do think that it was addressed earlier um and i may be wrong but i believe i remember seeing it on reddit that uh damage was talking about it saying that we you know we are looking into making more content from the expansions free sooner um and not hiding behind a paywall for years until we're ready to get rid of the expansion basically i think once you get into a regular cadence of doing that and maybe fix new light for the final time then you could probably leave it on cloud but that then that that's the biggest thing to me is I get not having it on Game Pass because I think the expectation of having it on Game Pass is, oh, well, I'm going to get all this shit with it. And well, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. But I'd still really selfishly like that base game to be playable through the cloud. Right. I don't know. So we, we will we will wait with bated breath to see if anything changes in the next few months. Uh, but suffice it to say, I've got to go out of town twice uh in the next couple of months one two weeks after the anniversary event the other probably like two weeks after the witch queen raid launches so uh i will still be deep in story content by that point in the witch queen it's about a month after launch really 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 like playing on my tablet <laughs> i yeah. like playing on my ipad yeah <sighs> Corey, do we have anything else we have to talk about no before the end of this episode we do not josh you're welcome. We can save that voice for two weeks from now. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to. Um, like we said, top no no lore corner tonight. Uh, we chose to talk about some Halo instead. Uh, yeah. But I am uh, I am working on a uh, a recap of what's gone on uh, since the launch of Beyond Light in terms of story and especially in terms of Sabathun. I'm writing my script out right now, and that's what I kind of plan to use next week's uh, week off to work on. Uh, while I'm sitting around at home and uh, hopefully we'll record that uh, sometime in December to put up uh, over the Christmas holidays. Yeah. So we still have some regular content coming out, but uh, 
that we don't have to be here for. <laughs> so we can take <laughs> we can take a few weeks off at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, so we we want to do that. We you know sometimes we just need a little break. You know. We we have definitely needed a break. Uh, I'm tired of been, Josh. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It, it's it's been a it's been a crazy it's been almost 18 months since we launched this show uh it's been about 18 months since we first talked about it and we've noted this before we've never really had a normal time doing this because ever since we started it we've been stuck in the middle of a pandemic yeah um and it's it's weighed on both of us uh a lot you know mentally and emotionally and this show's kind of been the one con uh constant for us i think like outside of you know familial and uh workplace obligations so this is the one thing like thursday night i know you know i could set aside all the bullshit for 90 minutes and come in and just hang out with destiny um yeah and hopefully better days are ahead in 2022 uh yeah. as, as we get closer to the end of the year we've only got a couple more episodes left i know what do we got like three real episodes left in the year Corey? i think so let's see we got the week after the thanksgiving third... yeah, yeah about three got, episodes Left for the, the third, year. tenth, and about the seventeenth. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, a couple little couple bonuses in there. Uh, maybe some, maybe some surprises if we can get some things lined up. Maybe even um, uh, that Spartan Slayers episode once Halo launches. Maybe even a Spartan Slayers episode. Uh, really would still like to do that one. Uh, I'm making sure we don't have. I did. I don't forget any questions or comments real quickly. Um, and I did not, so before you get us on there. Alright. Well I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening to this episode of Tower Casuals. You can find us on Twitter at Tower Casuals. You can email the show your questions at towercasuals at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would like to. It'd be great. Josh, where can we find you? At Josh underscore Finn, two N's on Twitter. Nice. You can find me at I am Corey and HD on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. We're going to get out of here. I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. And until next time, we're not next week, two weeks. In two weeks. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye bye.